Hey guys, I'm here with Eugene Cotley Ranko, director of Wobble Palace, one of my favorites of 2018, and most recently, Spree, starring Joe Keery, Sashir Zameda, David Arquette, and a whole bunch of other big names. You kind of got a bit of a dream cast on this one, with all the influencers and stuff. How did you sort of know who was within grasp to reach out to in pre-production? Um, well, in terms of in grasp, this is the first movie I've made that we have casting director on. So that was pretty cool to be able to work with someone, you know, who in my previous films was basically like, oh, this is a person sort of within my personal network, or this is someone that I like from Instagram or Facebook. Let me just message them and see if they're as interesting as they seem from a distance. And I think like real casting is basically like that too, except instead of contacting people who basically have no interest in professional acting. You're working with people who want to be actors and stuff and who have uh, experience. Um, so yeah, Rebecca Dealey was our casting director and you know she set up the meetings with Joe and with Sashir and with David and everyone else. Kyle Mooney is sort of a friend of mine. He, I met him through Kate Scheel, who um, was a, a very close, who's a fr close friend of mine and who was the lead actress in A uh, Wonderful Cloud which is the movie I made before, Wobble Palace. Um, Josh Olvai, who plays uh, Bobby the Influencer, he was actually brought to my attention through um, our social media consultant, Honor Levy, um, because he had a big Vine presence. He had, he, his Vine personality was Josh Kennedy, and so she showed me his stuff, and I was like, this is so funny. He's so funny. So we found a way to reach him not through um, our casting director, um, Lala Kent, who's from Vanderpump Rules, you know, reality TV, and uh, Frankie Grande, you know, who's like Ariana Grande's brother and a bunch of Disney shows. They just sent in tapes, and I thought their tapes were really good. And Misha Barton, you know, Misha Barton. Cool. Um, I, I see Drake is an executive producer. Yeah. How'd that sort of happen? It's kind of like a long road, but basically, I was, I probably met with like between 30 and 40 companies to try to uh, get money to make the film. Um, they all were really enthusiastic about it. And then obviously when, hey, so do you want to do it? They think, well, uh, we don't really know. Like, oh, my boss didn't quite get it. Or like, um, <laughs> are you sure you want to shoot the whole thing on like iPhones and dash cams? Or like, we don't know, he's going around killing people. Could he just be kind of like dropping them off in the wrong spot? <laughs> or something. Um, so, you know, it was a struggle. Um, although there were a few people who really championed the film. So one of those people left the company that she was at. She's like, I have something in my eye. Sorry. Oh, you're good. Um, one of those people was named Sumaya Kabe. She left. She was at Annapurna. She left there. And um, one time I saw Claire Denis do a Q and A, and she was like coughing the whole time. And like, I'll never forget all the coughing she did. And I feel like my eye is gonna be. Anyway, um, she's a good director, Claire Denis. Okay, um, Sumaya so Kave. Back to the matter at hand, Sumaya Kave. Yeah, she left Annapurna. She formed a new company with a colleague of hers named Matt Budman called Forest Hill. And Forest Hill has a like first look deal with Drake and Drake's company, Dream Crew, which did Euphoria and Top Boy and a bunch of other stuff. And so she was a big champion of the movie at Annapurna. It didn't happen there. So she is the first project that she sort of brought to uh, Dream Crew in Forest Hill. And they were into it. I had a meeting with them. By that point, Joe was kind of already on. And they got it, you know, really. And it, and it wasn't like one of these things where like a cool exec at the company gets it and they can't convince their boss. It's like, the people who are in control there are the cool execs at Dream Crew, so it's easy, it's good. Um, but like, you know, I didn't get like direct notes from Drake or anything, it's just kind of. Well, um, I, I imagine this probably wasn't the first film you've gotten studio to studio pitching. Um, well, this was the, fir the first one that got any money, but yeah, yeah. I, I probably, probably did this like, three or four times, three times before with other scripts that I wrote that never got made. So like, like Wobble Palace, for instance, with a movie I made before that wonderful cloud or movies I made before that, those were just movies that I made, made like in between trying to make the movies that I spent all my time writing. 
So, you know, it's like you get a crappy corporate job or a cassette job or whatever job you can get. You work it for six months, hopefully, sometimes nine months, and you have enough money to live, to pay your rent, to pay your loans, to eat tuna fish and rice or whatever. And you write your script and then you go around shopping the script and then you're running out of money, you're running out of time and no one wants to make it. And you're just like, I have, I know there's cool people around me. Like, I know I can probably try to like get some small amount of money from some random person who buys art for way more than it costs to make like a cheap movie. And those movies like Wild House and Pot are made like literally in the course of two to four months between like, this is an idea I have. This is like me writing it like in, a, in like a tr long treatment. Now we're going to shoot it in seven days. Now we're going to edit it in two months. Now it's done. You know, and so Spree was a really different process because it's like real producers, real money, real actors. And the post-production process was extremely long. Right. So uh, Wonderful Cloud and Wobble Palace premiering at South By, was that sort of... That was awesome was that did you see sort of more resources from having premiered there or oh i mean between uh wonderful cloud which premiered in 2015 and wobble palace which premiered in 2018 like no they're essentially both on the same level you know so you do i don't know i uh, i got a manager from wonderful cloud that tried to get me actually tried to get me a lot of auditions as an actor <laughs> yeah, which is a horrible idea because I'm not I don't have any range you know just like riffing on my own shit um I didn't really get not really you know yeah. I mean th those movies if you told any Hollywood person how much they cost to make they would think you're like kidding or that you're a joke or like what's the point of working with this guy well you know um <laughs> Uh, well, so that's between Wonderful Cloud and Wobble Palace. Has there been, so after Wobble Palace, did you see a little more? Well, so after Wobble Palace, I already had the script of Spree ready and I made it like more genre specific because I know that's easier to pitch than my other scripts, which were a little bit more like agnostic, I guess, or a little bit more just like driven by like, oh, this is obviously fucking cool. Like people will get that it's cool. Like you can't do that. They don't get anything. So you have to do like a genre-ish thing. Um, so that's how I had like these very formal 30 meetings and a few of them went kind of far, like the Annapurna one. Or I had one with Bazilevs, which is the company that does like the unfriended movies and stuff. And ultimately, you know, both, everyone has to feel good about stuff and sometimes they don't feel good and sometimes you don't feel good. So at the end of the day, um, it was sort of this Drake thing, which is a little bit like a coincidence, happy accident, you know, because they didn't. And our other investor um space maker also just like a happy accident just someone who this is their first film they read the script or they saw wobble palace you know so it does right you just you have to go out there and make the movies right and right. and hopefully they're good enough for people like you taylor or someone else to see them and appreciate them for what they are and be in, enthusiastic about them and it would be amazing if someone who has money and who's interested in movies teaser movie is enthusiastic about it so <clears throat> that's um you know it's all part of it but you have to grind and you have to just really do it and not sit around and wait because you'll never get i don't think you'll ever get money or approval if you're trying to do new things um just by kind of like not you know begging or like hoping or praying or whatever it is so is that sort of how you prioritize projects with everything on the back burner working with other people and stuff uh co-writers um i don't know exactly how you mean like how i prioritize a project is one is the subject matter feel really relevant important two can i get executed in a way that feels like new to me and like energetic three um do i have the resources to do it you know sometimes that's number one because you you usually you try to have as many, a lot of projects going at the same time, at least in your head and on paper and stuff. And then it's like, do you have the resources? Like if no one's going to give you funding, what can you do just on your Zoom? You know, like I made a movie 10 years ago that was just um, on Skype and Gchat video. That was with no crew or no cast. I just talked to people that didn't even know I was recording them, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. 
and you know and since then i've made like a bunch of music videos just on my iphone you know and i mean that's good practice for free right like it's just on your iphone so when you've you've got all these projects and someone comes up to you and you know in, in this case has the idea of the ride share killer um it's sort of the the potential there that makes you jump on the project yeah, yeah, so Spree is a really unique because it's the first time, I mean, up until now, but it's the, it was the first time that someone came to me with an idea that they had, which is our, my co-writer, Gene McHugh, and right, and his idea was a rideshare driver going around and uh, killing people. And I thought, like, that's really, could be really good minimalist horror, you know, dimension to it, and maybe let's try to make it, you know, fucked up or whatever. And then um, I said, Why? And this was around like late 2015, early 2016. And we had, you know, seen sort of like the bubbling up of um, the alt-right, you know, b before Hillary Clinton, but like after Trump had announced he was running, you know, like kind of we saw that and we were like, okay, let's kind of use this movie to like make fun of like these alt-right people and also like expose how scary they are and stuff. And we wrote that for a while and it was feeling good. And then Trump got like, like, you know, he was, he won the nomination and we were like, Oh my God, this is, this would be really important. Our movie would actually be really important because when he loses, um, it'll like remind people this moment in 2016 when stuff was like really scary. And then he won. And then we were like, the movie feels like kind of wrong now because like people won't, even if, even if the satire is really harsh, people will just see that it's like a white guy going around killing people based on an ideology that we don't like and they just won't move past like the superficial nature of it of, of, of the optics of seeing that and so we just sort of tabled the script for a while and then I made Wobble Palace and blah 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 and then like while I was finishing Wobble Palace I was like what if he's not driven by that ideology what if he's not actually driven by an ideology at all and what if he's just driven by like you know thirst for social media attention um because the cloud yeah was he's just a cloud chaser right and um and I, I realized like at a certain point in like the you know you put something away and you don't think about it but you are thinking about it in the back of your mind i just sort of realized like that's what all of these like sort of like you know white male mass murderers and non-white male mass murderers out there are after anyway they just want to be the center of the narrative you know they just want the cloud they want the attention. They want to feel relevant. And, you know, this goes back all the way to, like, Columbine, too, probably. And, obviously, some serial killers, too. Anyway, so this was a kind of, like, my diagnosis of this thing, which is that, you know, they all want attention to be center of narrative. And so do influencers. And so do all of us. Because that's the promise of social media, right? That you are, you know, central. And the world revolves around you, your friend network and your feed, and, you know. And so Kurt's definitely a, a, a target with the movie, even with the, the little pathos he gets. But um, I mean, in all your films, the characters are pretty much universally shitty. Not necessarily to that extent, but even in Spree, you know, everyone he's killing kind of gets a chance to, you know, demonstrate their shittiness. Um, so I'm wondering with, maybe not so much with Spree because there is a target, but with something like Wobble Palace or A Wonderful Cloud, um, I guess what's sort of the line between sort of self-reflection and behaviors that the movie's actively saying, you know, don't do this because it's shitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, well, I don't think, especially those previous films, I'm saying like, you can't do this. But what I'm trying to do, I think like A Wonderful Cloud is kind of like sort of a like death knell of like a hipster culture, right? They're like our vintage clothes, like sellers, you know, and all the people who kind of visit are sort of like the dregs of like a dying hipster culture. And then um, Wobble Palace is kind of like this like pre-Trumpian kind of like millennial who's just into like, you know, like art and like expression and all this shit. I mean, it's, a critique and it's a satire and it's like a self-satire you know one thing I think about when I make those films but also just when I'm like casting is like you know John Cassavetes movies he always cast himself as the most like like wretched person in those films the most like you know piece of shit person and I think 
he was trying to expose something about himself and the people he saw around him that he didn't really, um, he thought was too brutal to assign to other people and that maybe he didn't trust other people to really go as hard or as um, naked as he did in those kind of shitty roles and husband and Minnie and Moskowitz and you know, ultimately as he's dying in love streams. Um, and I thought that's really important. Like you need some avatar to expose the sort of like delusional narcissism and sort of blind conceit that drives everyone to think that they're cool or good. Or I mean, and Spree, for instance, Kurt thinks he's doing something good, right? He's offering a tutorial about how to go viral. Like that is, in his mind, inherently a moral service, you know? And divorced, obviously, from the actual morality of, you know, murder being fully fucking evil. Um, and I think these sort of blind spots in our own sort of like projected, like, noble identity is like, you know, a big part of all of my films. Um, and I think also it all gets twisted through, you know, the internet and our, the way we mediate our relationships and stuff. And, you know, Dasha, for instance, the Jane character played by Dasha and Nekrasova in Wabu Palace, her, you know, in that film, the Eugene character in the first half is so extroverted in his like transparent narcissism and like egoism that like, um, it's just kind of hard to watch, but hopefully like, you know, funny, relatable, whatever. But you know, the Jane character, she's more introverted, right? So we came up with this sort of voiceover that was able to sort of like project her own sort of like, you know, sort of narcissistic self-involvement out into the world. Because, you know, it's like these two, coin these two um, sides of like the same coin of like this sort of, you know, projections that we, um, projected identity that we think is really kind of sophisticated or um, hidden, hidden in a way that's extremely transparent in everything that we do on social media. And I mean, in 2020, for sure. And you've definitely, um, your subject matter has been a lot about technology and social media and stuff from the start. Um, but, you know, the, the past few films, at least, um, have also been pretty specific to LA. So, what would you say is sort of the connection or the, the differences in critique there um, between the two? Um, well, all of my films actually, back to Zeros and Ones, my first movie, um, have been in LA. I mean, I think LA is, you know, I don't want to say, it's actually hard to say that, I, you know, I think historically you could say it's almost like the focal point, right? Like the, the, geographical crystallization of like a culture of striverism and you know like uh, fame as like the the goal right and fame obviously is just like you know the ultimate form of narcissism right that everyone loves me and knows me and stuff um i think like maybe social media has created like an laification of the rest of the world where like it doesn't matter where you live, you're basically in a virtual LA at all times in that it's completely spread out. There's no focal point and everyone's goal is to just be fucking famous, you know? So in that way, I think it's like the, the sort of myth, myth mythos of LA um, is kind of very relevant. And at the same time, the city itself is just very like whatever. I've always thought it's kind of like a blah, experientially, like a very blah city, you know, so you don't get like the Malibu beaches or like, you know, cool palm trees and like Beverly Hills or whatever in my movies. You get like squalid apartments and like, you know, fecal matter all over the place. And like, you know, dry, instead of palm trees, you're driving under like overpasses and stuff like that. And like, you know, so that's kind of like Eugene's LA. <laughs> Right. And I, f I feel like the landscape is, has sort of shifted. Obviously, Hollywood is, you know, inseparable from L.A., but I feel like, um, you know, movies, pre-production, you can do remotely. Post, you're kind of just sending hard drives around. And then production, you can just fly people in. You don't even need everyone there at the same time. But, um, you know, in the, the age of influencers, I feel like L.A. has become almost more of a uh, a crucial hub for them than for filmmakers just because they have to 
you know, pumps so much shit out constantly. Well, also like Hype House, Sway House, it still right. has that place in our culture, just mythically. So, you know, there's still a migration of influencers into these like communal homes and stuff. I mean, also like, you know, it's just the place where everyone figured out how to make money off of entertainment, right? You have your managers and your agents and your fucking lawyers and everyone based here. So as soon as some of the influencers start making a ton of fucking cash from like YouTube ads or sponsorships, they're going to be hunted down by, you know, the people who sort of live on the fringes and like make their percentages off this. And it invariably ends up in this sort of like place where capital is, you know, focused on making money off of, entertainment um so i think that's why they end up in la a lot of the time but in terms of film production like every movie i made before spree probably i could have made in definitely new york or boston but also probably like cleveland or detroit or you know what i mean it's just if you have the right small group of people most of the people who worked on my previous films like they don't they haven't worked in a lot of other movies but i would say the one benefit of living in la is that occasionally you know, you do run into people who work on a lot of commercials or um, a lot of like big studio projects. And when you come to them and say, hey, do you have like seven days to like shoot this movie? And I got, you know, you, you present your passion and you present like whatever the vision is and like it feels fun. They'll just do it for like very nothing, you know, very little or nothing um, because they, it's just a change of pace for them. And so then you end up working with really high level technical and artistic people who you might not have access to in Cleveland or Detroit, probably. So going back to uh, Eugene's LA, um, your films are obviously, they have these, um, you know, deep satirical um, threads, but there's also a lot of lowbrow humor throughout. Uh, how much of that is sort of ironic, like for the character itself, and how much of it is just, you know, we'll put a cum joke in the, the log line because it's funny. Well, okay, I like different registers of humor. You know, those are the sort of, you know, artworks and films and stuff I respond to. Like, I love Shakespeare has lots of different registers of humor. You know, Pedro Almodovar has lots of different registers of humor. I mean, thinking about kind of how people respond to the humor in Spree, um, now that it's out, you know, and have wildly divisive response from critics and from viewers, although I think viewers are hewing a lot more positively than, you know, formal critics. Um, I think the response is maybe very similar to something like a Brian De Palma movie, where, um, you know, those films are, have a very distinct comedic tone that is, has a certain level of sort of detachment and a certain, like, pretense towards, like, a lot of ideas, formal ideas and thematic ideas that I think he's exploring. Um, and people get very kind of uncomfortable when you explore actual deep ideas um, or you're trying to do something formally innovative. And then the characters are acting in a completely like satirical way or completely like stupid way, which I, or campy way, you know? Um, people have a hard time in the moment synthesizing the seriousness or the you know quality of something with that tone and then over time the people who didn't get it just fade away and then the people who did get it champion the thing because they understand that this sort of conflation of like tones between like elevated and lowbrow and serious and like stupid um is really unique and kind of rare, and then, you know, it sort of builds up over time. And so that's what happened with fucking Dress to Kill and Raising Cain and Femme Fatale, and will probably hopefully happen with um, Passion. I don't know if you've seen that Brian De Palma movie, Passion, but it's very good and extremely, like, you know, underrated and underappreciated, so. And hopefully something like Spree, too, I mean, I think. Right, right. Um... And so talking about that uh, receptive division, um, have you seen a difference between, um, you know, with Spree, you say um, it seems like the viewers are responding to it a little more than the critics. Have you seen that sort of flipped or has that been consistent with your previous films? Oh, this one's gotten way more attention than my previous films. Probably in the first week of release, Spree has been seen by more 
people than all of my other movies combined, you know, in terms of critics reviews and in terms of like, all my indicators are just from like letterboxed and some numbers that I got from the distributor. So yeah, I mean, Spree's been seen. Yeah. Like I said, so, um, I don't know. Like I, I think teenagers really respond well to Spree because they actually see, you see the problem is, I mean, clearly there's a generational divide between critics who are mostly like older millennials to Gen X to boomers who don't really understand a lot of like the nuance of the critique and that like every line in the film is kind of a reference to something, whether it be virtual or learned um, social media behavior or like, you know, an illusion or something. Um, and so they just look at the movie like uh, iPhone equals bad or social media equals bad. But like, I think a younger person watching the movie who understands like the sort of like behavioral nuances and the sort of motivations, you know, between, between the transactional sort of motivations that are so kind of common between people who like regularly use social media and almost like unspoken and how that is like a motivating factor for all and for the psychology of all the characters from the father to like a random writer to Kurt. Um, they just pick up on the humor in a much more like deep and interesting way um, as they track throughout the movie. Um, and so they get that the critique is layered as opposed to just like, oh yeah, he's killing people for clout, like got it, okay, whatever, you know? Um, so I think that's kind of the major divide. Um, my concern before we released, I was like, well, you know, I, I tried really hard and I think everyone tried really hard to make sure that people got that we were making fun of the mass murderer, like that this wasn't something like Natural Born Killers or like American Psycho or something where we like, you know, wanted to aestheticize or fetishize the um, killer because that's like the op the point of the movie was to like, hey, we need to like laugh at Elliot Rogers, you know, we need to like laugh at like these people who think that they're being slick or that they're being like an arch villain, but that they're actually like so stupid and their schemes and their performance level is so like low and transparent, you know, and how poor it is. And we need to ridicule these people um, and make it uncool. Because I do think that the internet and traditional media and films had do a really good job of making killers seem like cool, you know? Right, any publicity. Um, but that was my concern kind of, you know, going, going before the release and that didn't really happen. We didn't really get leveled with that criticism of like, oh, this movie is glorifying, you know, killing or whatever, which is good. I'm happy about that. But then we got leveled with the criticism of like, I think I've seen this before. Well, it's like, yeah, if you're like a media elite critic or something like that, like you probably do end up thinking about these things, but reflect on how often they're actually depicted in a way that's like authentic. Like maybe Black Mirror, I guess, speculative right. fiction, you know, I, I don't know. Um, so. I think, you know, I don't know about you, Taylor, but like when I was 15, 16, 17, that's when I saw the movies that I think had the biggest impact on me, you know, where it feels like a little bit dangerous, like should I even be watching this? Or like, I, I know this is like saying something deep, but like, oh, oh, I get it. By the end, you're like, I get what it's saying. And it makes you feel like cool, like someone's communicating with you because, you know, it's like it was entertaining, but it said something and it felt cool and it felt like, badass or something anyway so if, if the movie reaches that, that age group I, i'm extremely happy right yeah you mentioned um a clockwork orange as one of the references um i i think i was like 13 when i first saw that so that was Me too. one of the first films where yeah it like felt like i was watching something wrong yeah and that movie shows in such an inspirational way like the potential for cinema at least for me, when I saw it, I was like, wow, he's really combining like music and photography and something that I knew was like a book. So it's like literature and, per and you know, like whatever. It just feels really like amazing to be able to synthesize all those elements into like one thing. And then the sum is like actually greater than the parts. And um, I don't really, I don't know that Spree does that. I wouldn't go that far, but I do think, uh, I do hope on some level the movie is inspirational and in that like, whoa, like you can tell a story that like, feels different and looks different 
and you know you can use iPhones and dash cams and you know yeah right and in the marketing you've sort of had to pigeonhole it into a genre a thriller but it's not really a thriller because it's a, a satire on <laughs> um, but for some reason not many movies market themselves like that even if they are it's hard really sure why that is I mean historically satire is like the most reviled and misunderstood genre um, from you know every everything like Ace in the Hole is a great example um, that movie is Billy Wilder's biggest flop until his like later 60s movies right and that's a great satire same thing with um, what's it called Face in the Crowd um, you know Dr. Strangelove was you know very pretty critically acclaimed however I did find uh, in the New York because we had a huge pan in the New York Times um, Spree did and I was, I was so upset I was like you know like our first big review and it was like it was like actually like this is a sick unfunny stupid like movie you know and I was like, and the characters are all like annoying as the most annoying characters. And I was like, I got in the shower after I read it. And I was like, well, like all the characters in Dr. Strangelove are extremely annoying. Like I could probably just swap out where it says spree in this New York Times review and just put in Dr. Strangelove and it'll read like they're making, like they're trashing that movie. And so when I got out of the shower, I was like, well, I wonder what the actual review was for Dr. Strangelove. And I found it. And like the first four paragraphs are pretty praise, you know, like lots of praise. But then the last three paragraphs are really like, this is a sick movie that is like completely unfunny to me. And like, why would they do this? And all of the characters are like too stupid. And like, what is it trying to say? And I was like, okay, there, I, that is exactly what happened. So I'll just take that, forget the first four paragraphs and put it out into the world as a uh, New York Times gets it wrong again. And, um, you know, it's like a interesting, interesting way to understand it. Anyway, satire, you know, whatever, Starship Troopers, Fight Club. I mean, if you look on the Rotten Tomatoes for Fight Club, go to Rotten Tomatoes, click on top critics. When you click on top critics, it's going to be all green splats. Okay. Top critics means that those reviews come from like the newspapers when that movie came out. So you'll see the date, like 1999. That movie does not have a rotten score on Rotten Tomatoes. It has like an 85% score on Rotten Tomatoes because all of the red tomatoes are like bloggers accumulating on Rotten Tomatoes over the next 10 years who like really like the movie and have the distance from the, you know, release in 1999 to like see like, hey, people like this. I'm a person. I think this is great. A lot of this shit is just Kool-Aid drinking, you know, like... Like you saying, you think Wall of Palace is like a great movie or whatever. You're like a person who's like not scared to like have an opinion. Even if that opinion is like, this fucking sucks. I don't have people be like, this fucking sucks and here's why. Or this is fucking amazing and here's why. Then people being like, oh my God, that was so much fun. It was such trash. Three stars out of five. Well, it's like, well, you only think it's trash because you didn't see the A24 logo in front of it. You've been trained to think that that elevates things, you know? Like, if a movie is fun, then probably it's good. That's how I feel. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's kind of ironic um, as uh, not necessarily poorly marketed, but um, poorly received a lot of satires are. I'm thinking, like, last year... Um, Jojo Rabbit was very much advertised as a satire like that's the word they kept using in all the advertisements and then it's kind of just um, it, it doesn't exactly um, what am I trying to say it, it doesn't take it all like the resolution of the film is right. the film telling you hey this thing is bad I mean what the is the satire of Nazis like you know it had no real world paradigms in terms of, like the sort of critique of like sort of like you know hatred um, like ethnic cleansing like propaganda like it doesn't actually track with anything we're experiencing like, you know like when you watch a movie like there will be blood or something like that which is probably way more enigmatic than something like Jojo Rabbit you can actually feel like, ooh, there's something fucking wrong with our obsession and dependence on oil. You know, even though that's like not even about, hi, 
even though that's not even a mask wearing uh, roommate. You guys wear masks? <laughs> not not in the apartment. He's probably going somewhere. Yeah, he's probably going somewhere. He's like, hey, do you need any food? Like, do you want? Me yeah. To well, first? I can go hungry. You missed your chance. Where do you live? Uh, New York, Manhattan. Got it. Um, okay, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you have a feeling of like some thematic thing that feels relevant, even though it's like 100 years ago in that film, instead of not teasing it out. Whereas Jojo Rabbit, it's like, <clears throat> like, Nazi's bad, orange man, Nazi. You know, like, like, that's not even in that movie. It doesn't feel like that. But they have to, you see, in that marketing scheme, they have to use the word satire because that's the only word that justifies the idea of like, we're going to make a bunch of jokes with people in Nazi outfits. Exactly. You know. Um, so, I, yeah. I didn't hate the movie, but I do feel like no, I, it has that sort of cheap sentimentality that I really, that's like the thing I hate most in movies. I love to cry in a movie, but you have to kind of earn it. You know, and that yeah. movie has sort of the cheap sentimentality that I don't care. Some sort of uh, device that that they don't really build organically i don't know whatever people uh, no hate no hate right I mean, no it's... everyone should should make the movie they want to make and hopefully it's uh and if, i think movies the most important thing is like try to advance the language and try to be entertaining because we're at this moment culturally where movies no longer um are are you know automatically relevant like you can't expect anyone to give a shit about any movie and so when you put out a lot of art house movies or a lot of fucking Marvel movies or a lot of whatever studio movies and people take the chance, right? Much more on an art house movie than a Marvel movie, but still people are putting fucking money, like going to a movie theater is expensive. And then we fucking is nothing special. It sucks. It's boring. It's a formula or it's willfully like anti-entertainment. Like a movie like The Lighthouse or something is like so painful for me to watch. Or, you know, and I can only imagine like a normal person going to see that and having to be like, like, what? Like, why am I watching this? That does a huge disservice to like movies because the person who took a risk on that because they like Robert Pattinson or whatever, like, isn't going to go see like an art house film ever again, <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, um, and that's my opinion, you know, people can sit there and you know, watch the lighthouse and come up with all sorts of meanings and all sorts of speculation and create mystery where there is none and create, you know, sort of like allegorical meaning where I find none. And that's fine. You know, that's the type of way of movie watching and movie appreciation that I am fine with, but it does not do anything good for like people's interest in movies because you must entertain. It's a popular medium. It's a commercial medium, you know, and, and do something new too. Because people don't are not scared of new things. They're just scared of new things, new looking things and new feeling things when it's mixed with something really boring and anti-character and anti-narrative. And oftentimes the people who are interested in formal innovation are not interested in narrative. And that creates, you know, a bad reputation for things that feel cool and new. But you know, I'm on a crusade against that. Well, the uh, the only other question I have is a little less related to Spree, but um, I've seen in some of your interviews, you mentioned assisting Agnes Varda back mm, in the day. Yeah. And um, I was a little curious about how that came to be, what that sort of consisted of. No, that was um, obviously an amazing um, moment in my life. Um, so I moved to LA. I did not know anyone, you know, in the industry. Um, I would literally go around to bars and um, what it was kind of pre-art opening before that was kind of like the thing. So I would go to like concerts and stuff. And I literally walk up to random people I didn't know and ask them like, listen to them, talk to them, be like, hey, like anybody work in movies? Like, uh, do you know anything about Hollywood, whatever? And I would like literally give people my phone number hoping that someone would give me a job. Meanwhile, like, you know, looking on Craigslist for like the worst, you know, gig. Um, eventually after like two or three months, someone called me and said, I have a job for you. I said, amazing, what is there? It pays no money. I was like, I'm not going to take this job by. I'm hanging up. They said, it's working with Anya's Varda. And I said, oh, okay, I will do that for free, for sure. Because, you know, it's like a living legend, right? Um, so it was the uh, it was the LA portion of her movie, Beaches of Anya's, where, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like 
different uh, beaches around the world that she's lived in. It gives her an opportunity to reflect on her life. It's like an autobiographical thing. Um, so I did a week on that just as a PA, you know, digging ditches, like helping art departments, a small crew. Anya's always carrying a lot of equipment, always like ahead of everyone else between scenes, always like stopping, putting stuff down. It's like, it's not on the shot list, but let's do it. Like, oh, I see something and it's just beautiful, let's take it. And then at the rap meeting, at the rap party, um, which is like a bar there in Venice, um, which is where she lived in the early 70s with her husband, Jacques Demy, and maybe late 60s, he made Model Shop there, and then she moved back there in the 80s, and she made a great movie called Documenter, and you know, she did a lot of California films about the Black Panthers, and uh, Sausalito, Uncle Yanko in between, and so she has this real love affair with Los Angeles and California and the beaches and stuff. Anyway, at the rap party, you know, her crew is kind of like getting drunk over here. And then she's at the bar by herself, like, you know, sipping on drink. And I was like, these people are cool, sure, like whatever, but like, I'm here to meet Anya and hang out with Anya. So I went up to her and we just started talking about movies and, um, you know, films that we love and photography and all that sort of stuff. It was so amazing to talk to her and I got brave enough to say, um, hey, you know, I make movies too. And I, you know, I had my little DVD of shorts that I made in case I ran into uh, Brad Pitt or something. And Anya says just as well. So I went to my car, I grabbed the DVD, I gave it to her. And then the next morning she called me at like 6 a.m. And she's like, Eugen. Uh, and I'm like, who is this? She's like, Agnes, do you think it is uh, maybe you and I, we could go shoot a little bit together? And I said, oh my God, yeah, that would be amazing. Like, you know, crust in my eyes. And I was like, when do you want to do it? And she's like, oh, in 13 minutes, maybe we can begin. And then I was like, uh, yeah. So, you know, I water on the face, toothbrush, and then you just drive. I was living all the way east in LA and she was in Venice. So I just drove like a zillion miles an hour, 6 a.m. and met up with her. And we just filmed for like four days, five days together um, with a little, you know, handy cam. She was filming and I'd be driving the minivan and then like, you know, I'd be like kind of like moving her around like a living dolly sometimes or I'd be filming her doing stuff and we'd meet like random Russian people doing exercises and like interview them and she'd see pigeons and like she'd think I'm gonna run into like the pigeons and film me and we had breakfast together and I was filming it and she's like, don't film this, this is stupid. And I was like, no, 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 that's good. And then she like dipped her um, napkin into coffee to like help, you know, some sort of like the wrinkles under her eyes or something like that. She's like, no, 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 don't do this. And I was like, no, this is weird. Like I've never seen anyone do this, Anya. It's like, I have to film this. She's like, okay. And so, you know, some of that stuff ended up in the movie, which is cool. And, um, and it was really inspiring to see her. Sorry, this is really anecdotal, but I, I think the, oh, main, yeah, I appreciate this. the main takeaway from for, for me um, was just seeing how she would be inspired, you know, by everything around her and saw kind of opportunities where other people would just kind of walk past. You know, she saw opportunities for poetry or like an entry point to sort of philosophically investigate something that was on her mind. And, you know, she came from a photography background um, and I think images and she could immediately sort of frame something, analyze it, and also see like the sort of like metaphorical power in it. And um, I think when she started making, you know, I mean, she made docs her entire career, but when she started making slightly, you know, Gleaners was a little, like that's kind of like her late career sort of shift, breakthrough to like sort of very, very much inserting herself um, semi-autobiographically -auto, uh, into stuff. Um, I think she was had calibrated her mind for at that point probably 60, 70 years to sort of find really interesting um, extrapolated value from any images that she made. You know, you just you know, like when you're when you're constantly thinking about filmmaking, images you know have this power that is beyond themselves, and uh, she was extremely tapped into that. And she's always working so hard always run, like uh, when we had the crew, she was just running it, you know? And it, it, and I think that was really important for me too. Like you have to be the hardest working person on a set, you know? And I think that sets the tone and inspires everyone and sees like, you know, this person's not full of shit. Like you have to really believe in what you're doing. You have to be free to kind of create. That's another thing like up, go, up you know, up, so stepping up from Wobble Palace to like Spree, there's like, 
40 people on that set as opposed to like seven, you know? And, um, and also there's a lot of like rules and plans and I still wanted the freedom to like mess around and come up with stuff with the actors or with the crew. If they had any ideas, you know, you welcome ideas from the crew too. Anyway, Anya was really inspirational in all those ways. She was receiving the images and ideas from the world and allowing it to inform her filmmaking constantly and just working really hard and just being really kind of like, you know, creative and humble. Um, and it was cool. And we maintained a relationship for, you know, basically until she passed, like I would always, whenever she premiered her movies, wherever I was, I would go and we'd say hi and, you know, talk and I'd send her links to my newest movies and stuff. And she was always, um, when she had time, she's really busy. When she had time, she's always super supportive. And um, I always wanted to kind of make her proud, you know, in a certain way. And um, I don't know if I did, but um, it's an, it was an amazing experience you know, to work with her. And I feel really lucky to have had it. Yeah, yeah that's really amazing that that happened um you had that relationship um that that moment of uh going up to her was that sort of something you were thinking of when you know in that scene in spree where he puts himself out there because that's one of the less social media specific critiques that's kind of just a an industry fear well i didn't yeah i didn't want to I didn't see connecting with Agnes at that moment as anything that was like career related or anything like that. Like it to me was just like, I've never met like a filmmaker before. Like I'd never met someone like what I will like really love their movies before. And this person had been doing it for so long and I thought the movies were so great. Like at that point I'd probably seen Cleo five to seven, Vagabond, Bonheur and you know, Gleaners. And I was just like, I have to, and I'd seen what she was doing on set and it, it felt, because at that point I maybe had worked on a few commercials, you know, Hollywood commercials, and just the way that she ran her set so kind of unpretentious and inclusive and um, creative. It's just like, how could I not talk with her? And she, and also she's just so, so brilliant too. Like if you ever watch interviews with her, or you, you know, went, went to a live Q and A with her, she was really aware of the sort of shortcomings of her moderators, always wanted to, you know, kind of provoke and entice audiences. She's very audience driven too. I mean, those films are extremely artistic, her films, but they're also extremely about communicating with audience expectations, with the contemporary sort of viewing audience, but also just whatever viewer was kind of locked into her world. And she was a really compelling, um, not just filmmaker, but kind of public speaker. And um, yeah, anyway, so, you know, how could I resist? And anyone, you know, it was shocking to me that she was sitting alone and the other people on the crew were not like all like, surrounding her. She's literally, you know, clearly the most compelling person in that, in like a five mile radius. Um, and oh. yeah. All right. Well, East um... East, and, uh, you know, if they have a screening room up in the sky. Like, I know they're screening her movies a lot and all the other greats. And, uh, you know, I, she loved movies, you know. So anyway, uh, <laughs> weird metaphor at the end there. But uh, <laughs> no, I, do, I think about her a lot, you know, going into like, I think, why do you make a movie too? Like, that's a really important question any filmmaker has to ask themselves, especially now where it doesn't seem like the dominant medium anymore. You have to ask yourself, like, why am I working in this medium and what do I want to accomplish? And I think, you know, with stuff I was talking about before, about formal innovation and entertainment and really saying something important. I think that's every one, every one of Agnes's films is like that. Um, so, yeah. Well, well um, that, that, that was my last question, but that was, that was a lot more than I was expecting to get. Thank you for, um, you know, indulging. Um, my pleasure. And yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on the Zoom, doing this interview. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching the film, Taylor, and taking the time. And, you know, I hope more people get a chance to see it and uh, it starts conversations and maybe inspires some people, hopefully, too. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have anything you want to plug for the interview? I just want to plug Spree. I, I think, like, you know, there's a huge contingent, I think, of teenagers who have seen it. And then, like, how old are you? Are you, like, over 25? I'm 20. Oh, you're 20? 
Okay, so you're in like the core there. Um, um, uh, I want people like who are like closer to my age to see it because I actually feel like no one over the age of 25 even knows it exists, you know? So that's to me the thing, just get conversations going. And people who are interested in film like you, I, I want, you know, some, I would love some real discourse around the film, formal, thematic, or otherwise. All right, well, you guys heard them. Spree, go go watch it, go talk about it. It's on YouTube, Amazon, Hulu, is it? No, it's on Hulu, it's on, I like actually, here's my plug, watch it on iTunes, even though I've never rented anything on iTunes. Watch it on iTunes because then it gets ranked and shit. Mm. And that's free advertisement if it's in the rankings. Gotcha. All right. Well, you heard it here first. iTunes, the way to go. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks, Eugene, for coming out. Really appreciate this. My pleasure. Thanks, Taylor.